participants across the U.S. who are tuning in uh, remotely. The joys of hybrid events, right? I've been, um, I live out in California now in San Francisco. So I work remotely almost entirely. I spend my time sort of jumping back and forth between San Francisco and Washington, D.C. And then I get to make stops like this along the way. So that's quite exciting. Almost entirely, I spend my time I'm going to turn this down. This is just so that I can see the slide decks that are going up. Um, so Samantha, if you can hear me on the other line, let's get that first deck up. Yeah, here we are. So today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the history of the United States' work in international food assistance programs. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about major trends in global hunger today. And uh, we'll also talk about a little bit of research that we've been doing at the World Food Program USA on the link between food insecurity and conflict and instability in the world. We know that that relationship has long existed in the opposite direction. Right, that when we have war and conflict, the natural outcome of that is poverty and hunger. But we are learning a little bit more about that relationship, of course, in the opposite direction. So for folks just joining online, uh, apologies for the late start there, but we're all set and moving at this point. But my name is Chase Sova. I'm the Senior Director of Public Policy and Research at the World Food Program USA. Uh, World Food Program USA is a nonprofit organization based in Washington, D.C., and we support the mission of the United Nations World Food Program here in the United States. So Samantha, if you can advance the slide for me here. We're gonna talk a little bit uh, when we start about the long history of these programs. Any issue, there we go. Um, and to me, this is a bit of a homecoming and I mentioned this to the audience here in, in the room. Abilene is the center of the story of international food assistance programs in the United States because of Eisenhower, President Eisenhower's work to establish some of our first permanent food aid programs, right? And so I want to walk you through the history a little bit so you understand the significance of Eisenhower's contribution here. But to do that, we've got to go a little bit further back in time to begin with, right? All the way back to the late 18th century. And in the late 18th century, in 1794, there was a slave rebellion in Haiti. And French nationals arrived at the shores of Baltimore, where those people were offered food and shelter uh, and other necessary things uh, arriving in American shores. And then the city of Baltimore did something pretty significant, historically speaking. They went to the United States government, the new federal government, and said, well, hey, we'd love to be compensated for the food and the things that we provided to the people landing on our shores. And so back in 1794, we have our first example of the United States government providing food aid of any variety uh, to foreign uh, individuals. Now you fast forward just a few decades after that and there's a tremendous earthquake in Venezuela. The United States at that point sends $50,000 worth of wheat flour to the people of Venezuela. And that's an important moment because it represents the first commodities, the first food that the United States ever sent to folks in need abroad. And then, of course, the event that most of us will remember, the Irish potato famine, the death of a million uh, folks in Ireland because of the potato blight that was affecting the crop there. Now, in that period of time, the United States government offered two military transport vessels, and those vessels were filled with goods from Catholic charities because of the large Irish uh, Catholic diaspora community in the United States. So in this early period of U.S. food aid programs and food assistance programs, these were small, they were short-term in nature, and they were largely based on philanthropy. There were no institutions that we had set up at that point to provide international food aid or food assistance to anybody. So Samantha, let's, uh, let's advance the slide, please. So in this period, um, a couple developments happen, right? Uh, let's see, are we up yet? There we go. Now we're in the area of the First World War, right? And in the First World War, the Great War, the war to end all wars, we suffered 16 million global deaths. And this is an incredibly important time period in the U.S. foreign aid program because the first time we start to see institutions established. Herbert Hoover is the food czar during this period. Long before he was president of the United States, he had that important role in responding to food aid programs or food needs, excuse me, in the European theater. 
And if we had, uh, Hoover had this great quote that you can see on the slide here now, and he said, the war has been brought to an end in no small measure by starvation itself, and it cannot be our business to maintain starvation after peace. So here you see the United States starting to scale up its efforts more in response to the First World War. And let's advance the slide. So in this period, a couple things happen. One is that we have the establishment of the, of the Commission for Relief in Belgium, led by Herbert Hoover. There we're providing assistance to about 10 million individuals uh, in Europe and Belgium uh, and France specifically. About five and a half million metric tons of American food that's sent abroad for the Commission for Relief in Belgium. But there's also two subsequent programs that are established as well, the American Relief Administration, and the U.S. Food Administration, right? These are really important because they invested over $100 million in European relief after the First World War. This is, these represent the first two named programs that we have in the international food aid portfolio of the United States, right? So let's advance the slide again. The First World War gives birth to the Second World War, and of course, the needs have skyrocketed even further, right? In this period, we have not just one theater of war in Europe, but another in North Africa and South Asia. And so we see President Roosevelt in this era really expanding U.S. food aid programs and bringing them to an entirely another level. Right? We had fifth, between 50 and 70 million people killed in the Second World War. There are some estimates that among the civilian casualties, half of those individuals died from starvation and starvation-related disease. So it was really an incredible test of American commitments to international food aid and food assistance and the programs that we launched in the Second World War uh, were much more sizable than even the Commission for Relief in Belgium or the American Relief Administration, and certainly more sizable than these first efforts we had in Venezuela and the Irish potato famine. America cannot remain healthy and happy in the same world where millions of human beings are starving. A sound world order can never be built on a foundation of human misery. And that's a quote from Roosevelt. Oh, sorry, Harry Truman. <coughs> So let's advance the slide one more time, if we can, Samantha. In this period, there are two new programs, or one new program in particular that is established, right? We had all done these programs individually previously, the Commission for Relief in Belgium. This, these are predominantly American programs providing aid to people around the world. What we try in 1943 is a multi-nation approach or a multilateral approach, where we say, listen, can we get others to join us in this cause? Can we get some folks beyond the Americans to provide food aid in the European theater and in the North African theater and the South Asian theater after the Second World War? And the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration is born under President Roosevelt. Now, this is an important time period because these programs uh, were a real test of whether we could entertain this international game of international food assistance, whether we could get other people to contribute to the cause in any meaningful way. And so in this period, the rehabilitation portion of the UNRWA program was a little bit uh, lost on Congress. People didn't want to spend dollars on rehabilitation. It sounded a bit like reconstruction. It sounded expensive. And the idea in this time period was that nations involved in UNRWA would each commit 1% of GDP to the cause to distribute food in the aftermath of the Second World War. And that would have cost the United States government at that time, in those dollars, about $3 billion in that time period. And it was, the price was too much to pay. And UNRWA folded in just three years after a short attempt at multilateralism. But then we have something really important happen, and now we're leading up into the Eisenhower administration. We have the Cold War begin. We have the Marshall Plan, which invested about $100 million or $100 billion in today's dollars in Europe uh, in rehabilitation efforts, mostly in an effort to try to control the spread of communism and to stop uh, great power competition between the US and the Soviet Union. And this is important because $100 billion 
uh, is more sizable than any program that we have today in terms of international food aid programs. And a lot of that came in the form of food assistance and agricultural development in the region. So we can advance the slide, please. Here you have a quote, of course, uh, from President Wilson, who says, Bolshevism cannot be stopped by force, but it can be stopped by food. And that was a really interesting change in the way that we thought about these programs, right? Because for a while, in the aftermath of the First and Second World War, we were providing food to our allies. Before that, we were providing food philanthropically. And suddenly, we were in this era of American history where we were providing food in a battle for hearts and minds around the world. And that's a critical change. We were providing foods in, er in order, with food in order to earn allies, not simply keep them. So you can advance the slide, please. And there was a certain irony, of course, in all of this, which was that modern American food aid programs were born out of necessity because of war. But they were also, in many ways, made possible because of war. Right? During the First and Second World War, the United States invested very heavily in agricultural productivity. We had mechanism on-farm mechanization arriving really in the 1920s and 1930s. We had new synthetic fertilizers that were being applied in the early 1940s, and some of those derived from the manufacturing of nitrogen bombs. We had increased modes and, and new modes of transportation, both over land and over sea. And so suddenly we had agricultural surpluses in the United States in the aftermath of the Second World War. And this is really where Eisenhower comes into, into, in, into this story in a meaningful way. Back in 1930, when we had an organization called the Commodity Credit Corporation, we were buying surplus commodities off of American markets uh, and storing those in, and uh, trying to drive up the price of grain for so many farmers across the United States who were producing these incredible surpluses. Fast forward to the early 1950s and 1955, during Eisenhower's first year in office, Commodity Credit Corporation went from spending $500 million on those surplus programs to almost $15 billion a year, which was incredible. We had a huge amount of agricultural productivity, and we had to find places for it to go. And so some of the early food aid programs were born out of this. And Eisenhower administration, in particular, was uh, really instrumental in starting a program that still exists today called Food for Peace. So we can advance the slide. Here we go, yes. Um, the Food for Peace program under Eisenhower's signing is a program that takes American-grown commodities, puts them on ships, and sends them abroad to people in need. It's still a big part of the way that we do food assistance today or food aid today. It's not the only way. We have cash assistance today. We provide people with vouchers and debit cards, and we provide them with unconditional cash transfers, and we provide you know, therapeutic foods that can bring a child back from starvation. But a central part of our programming still today relies on American farmers. And this was all born during the Eisenhower administration. We can advance the slide, please. The genius of this maneuver in many ways was this alliance between shippers and farmers in the United States. The reason that we still have the Food for Peace program today, which by the way has served more than 4 billion people around the planet with food aid over the past uh, almost 75 years. The reason we still have this is this incredible political alliance. Farmers are exceptionally proud of the role that they play in feeding hungry people around the world through these programs. And at the same time, the maritime community, who has a significant vested interest in the cargo preference require requirements of moving those commodities from A to B, are also invested in this program. And so the Food for Peace program up on Capitol Hill, where I spend a lot of time uh, in my work, has this incredible base of political support that ranges from people who have port infrastructure in their constituencies to people who have farmers in their constituencies. And so it's a really important uh, political base, but also a really important piece of the commodity of the food uh, assistance basket that we have today. In many places where the World Food Program is is working, and I'll talk to you a little bit about what the World Food Program is in just a moment. But where we're working, in many places, agricultural infrastructure has been destroyed. 
Rural markets have been destroyed. Markets in major city centers have been destroyed. And the only food that the World Food Program can deliver many times is U.S. grown commodities. It's high quality. It's predictable. We can get that into the pipeline. Even if it takes three or four months to arrive in a country, we know when it will be there and we can help feed starving people with those products. So the Food for Peace program is, is still incredibly important to the U.S. food assistance portfolio. So let's advance the slide, please. Eisenhower wasn't done with the signing of the Food for Peace Act. He also, in 1960, stood before the UN General Assembly and said, listen, we've tried this with Roosevelt, with the UN Relief and Rehabilitation Administration, but let's try again. We've got a great system in the United States called Food for Peace, and we'd love to see other nations get involved with this. He said, what if we could have a global agency where others contributed in the same way that the United States does? He called it a paradox, the idea that we'd have surplus in one part of the world and hunger in another. And how do we go about correcting that? So the World Food Program, if we advance the slide, the World Food Program was born just a year later in 1961. It's the reason that I'm standing here today working for the World Food Program some you know, 60, 70 years later. Two things happened in 1961. One was the World Food Program was established. The other is that the U.S. Agency for International Development was established under the Foreign Assistance Act. And that was incredibly important because it started to professionalize our international assistance operations. We'd gone through so many eras in the food aid world. We'd gone from support to our allies. We'd gone from fighting communism and great power competition. We've gone through the era of surplus disposal. All of this leading to international food aid system that was now built on the back of professional development experts and administered in large part by the World Food Program. One other thing worth noting in this modern era is, is 2002 when the McGovern Dole School Feeding Program was established. You know, Senator Dole, another great Kansan, has been so instrumental in fighting for both domestic and international food security in his career, right? When he passed away, uh, it was a considerable loss in the American legacy of food assistance and food security in the United States. Not only are our school feeding programs domestically owed a great debt of gratitude, owe a great debt of gratitude to Senator Dole, but so do our international programs. The McGovern Dole School feeding program is modeled after the American model. We take American grown commodities, we send them into schools all around the world, serving 40 or 50 million kids over its time in existence. So it's a powerful legacy. And there are others who are still in that vein. You know, when I go up to Capitol Hill today, there are other Kansans that I still lean on for support for these programs. Someone like Senator Jerry Moran sits on the Senate Hunger Caucus, Agriculture Committee, uh, Agriculture Appropriation Subcommittee, I should say. Someone who cares deeply about these causes and understands that he represents a very long legacy of Kansan leadership in these international food aid programs. See the same from Representative Tracy Mann right now in Kansas' Big First District. Another lawmaker who has been dedicating their time and attention amidst all of the other things happening up on Capitol Hill to this cause of global hunger. hunger. So between Eisenhower and Dole and Moran, and, and man, there is an incredibly powerful legacy here in this state of supporting international food aid programs. So let's jump ahead a slide if we can. So now we're into the World Food Program. This is a legacy, a thing that Eisenhower helped to build, that Kennedy brought into reality, that people like Senator George McGovern uh, helped to advocate for in its early days of existence. The UN World Food Program now is a massive, massive organization and probably one of the most important organizations that many people have never heard of, right? We know our UNICEFs, we know our UNHCRs, the World Food Program is the largest humanitarian organization fighting hunger in the world. It is the global safety net for many, many people who don't have access to food. It is the thing standing between millions of people, hundreds of millions of people and starvation. So the World Food Program serves about 15 billion meals a year, serving about 150 million people, give or take. We're trying to reach 180 million this year, if you can believe that. 
operating in about 80 countries and with a massive fleet of ships. This is a logistical behemoth. You know, 35 ships operate in the open ocean, moving food from where it is to where it needs to be. Uh, more than a couple dozen helicopters and planes to move food in difficult circumstances and uh, uh, about 6,000 trucks moving every day, uh, not to mention partner organizations beyond that. So this is a really big operation. Now, the World Food Program was awarded the 2020 Nobel Peace Prize for its work in conflict settings and its use of food as a tool for peace. We're going to talk about why that is in some slides coming up. Uh, but let's advance the slide quickly here if we can. And um, I want to give you a little bit more context on the uh, sort of global context. So what you're looking at now in the room and now on the screen is global funding to the World Food Program. This is funding, again, from the organization that Eisenhower helped to start or to the organization that Eisenhower helped to start. And if you notice here in the yellow, and it may be hard for some of you in the room to see, but in the yellow, is US contributions and everything else is global contributions. Now what you can take away from this is that the United States, this is just over a 10 year period or a 15 year period, but the United States in any given year provides between 40 and 50% of all the contributions received by the World Food Program. And that is a result in many ways of this legacy that Eisenhower started and that folks like Tracy Mann and uh, Senator Moran are, are helping uh, to keep running. So let's advance the slide quickly. What we're seeing now on this screen is a graphic of famine conditions around the world, or the number of people dying in famine, all the way dating all the way back to the late 19th century in 1870. Now, the spikes that you see on the left side of the graph are events that you may be familiar with. Soviet collectivization, China's Great Leap Forward, the Bengal famines, the Irish potato famine, what we, we are living in a period is the trough on the right side of the graph today. Because of the decisions made by the United States government, because of the decisions made by Eisenhower and the Food for Peace program, we now live in a world where famine is always a political choice, unless we get in our own ways to prevent stopping it. Humanitarian organizations are incredibly sophisticated today. I've talked to you already about the size and scope of what the World Food Program does. And others, other uh, organizations like nonprofit organizations that work alongside the World Food Program. So let's advance the slide briefly. Famine is a choice today. It is still happening in certain parts of the world. So I don't want us to, I don't want to suggest that things are better that the world is in a perfect spot right now, because frankly, since 2015, hunger numbers have been trending in the wrong direction. There's two ways to look at the hunger numbers that you may see in the news and the headlines uh, around the world today. We have about 800 million people around the planet who are living in what we call chronic hunger. Chron hunger marginalization. It's people who are skipping meals. They're engaging in negative coping mechanisms. They're selling off assets to be able to feed themselves. They might be consuming the wrong balance of micro and macronutrients. So there's 800 million people that fall into this category. Now we're going to advance the slide now and you'll see acute hunger, which is a very different type of hunger and the hunger that the World Food Program in particular tends to concern itself with. Acute hunger is the type of hunger that results from a shock event in someone's life. It could be a war, a natural disaster, but it puts people in a position where they don't know where the next meal is going to come from. These are people facing crisis levels of hunger. Now, this graph only goes up to 2021, but today we have about 333 million people who fall into this category of acute hunger. These are the people that the World Food Program are trying to reach in any given year. There are top priority individuals. Acute hunger has been trending in the wrong direction since 2015, but has grown substantially in the aftermath of the COVID pandemic. Prior to the COVID pandemic, we had about 130 or 150 million people in that category today, again, 333. So we'll talk a little bit about why that is on the next slide. If we can advance that, please. Global hunger today, acute hunger, the really difficult variety, is driven by three factors today. 
It's COVID-19, it's driven by climate, and it's driven by conflict. So let's advance the slide. I wanna talk first about COVID-19 because it's not something that's on the mind of many Americans anymore, right? We, of course, invested huge amounts of money here at home to respond to the economic concerns related to COVID-19, about $5 trillion domestically. Global GDP contracted pretty substantially in 2020. And while we're recovering here at home and things feel quite normal, even bullish or in the American stock market right now, there are places around the world who've never fully recovered yet, who have lost foreign reserve in significant amounts, who have seen their currencies devalued. And as a result of both the COVID-19 crisis and Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we're seeing food and fertilizer prices globally at 10-year highs. Highs we haven't seen really since 2008, 2007, 2008 global food crisis. So let's advance the slide. What you have to know about the global food system as well is that there are exporters and importers. There are parts of the world who rely very heavily on food imports. So they have to have foreign reserve available to bring those things in, and they've got to have a powerful enough currency to be able to afford them. The map that you're seeing right now in green are showing net exporters, and the map in yellow or orange are the folks who are importing food around the world. The vast majority of the developing world are net food importers. It means that in an event like COVID-19 and in an event like Russia's invasion of Ukraine, these people are at especially high risk of not being able to food, afford their food imports. And if you put a map up of food insecurity or the most severe forms of food insecurity around the world, it'll pretty much match up with the yellow regions on the map. So let's advance the slide. That's COVID-19. We're still dealing with those challenges today, slowly. On the climate concern, when you go back into the early 1990s and you start counting up climate-related extreme events, here we're talking flood events, drought events, heat waves, tropical storms. In the early 1990s, we would have been counting about 90 of these events a year. These are the types of events that the World Food Program is often called in to respond to. Today, we're dealing with more like 200 of those events every year. So it's very difficult to keep ahead of the natural disasters that are happening at a much higher frequency and magnitude today. So let's advance the slide. Now the climate challenge is not going to be uniformly felt across the world. What you're seeing here are maps of yield predictions out to 2050 for three main crops. I think this is potato, corn, and wheat. And the average rule of thumb in the climate change space is that for every one degree Celsius rise in mean temperature, we tend to see about a 10% fall in crop yields. Now that's not true everywhere. Maybe here in Kansas, you get a couple days at the tips and tails of your growing season, you might actually see some yield improvements, but the vast majority of people around the planet who are living, especially in the equatorial tropics, are going to be experiencing uh, pretty severe crop loss because of the impacts of climate change coming up into the next years. Crops there are just grown so close to their biophysical limits that even a couple degrees temperature increase, especially during flowering, can really lead to uh, devastating consequences for, for people around the world. So let's advance the slide and talk a little bit about the conflict challenge. Just give us one moment here for the tech to catch up. So it won't come to any surprise to anybody in the room here that we have major increase in recent years in global conflict events, right? What you're looking at here is a graphic of, of state-based violence, non-state violence, and, and uh, one-sided violence. This comes from a major database who collects this sort of information on a year-on-year -year basis. These events are rising pretty rapidly. Today, we've got the Council on Foreign Relations tracking 27 global conflicts, ranging from generalized instability all the way up to interstate war. And I think I would have told you probably about a year and a half ago that I thought the nature of conflict was fundamentally changing, that we had moved away from this war, this idea of war between countries, and we now are experiencing mostly non-state violence or non-state actor violence in countries. This is the rise of folks like Boko Haram and Al-Shabaab and ISIS who are fighting their own governments for supremacy. But then we've had the events in Ukraine and, and Russia. 
and we've had a ground war in Gaza, and we've had Azerbaijan fighting Armenia, Armenia over contested ch territory. And we've had other places around the world. Right now, we're, we're monitoring China's progress towards Taiwan and, and aggression towards Taiwan. So it's not clear whether we haven't moved into a new era of great power politics yet, that this global conflict that we're experiencing right now is going to break. It may worsen over time. And what we know in this new era of changing political and global dynamics is that food security is not going to improve as long as conflict becomes uh, the sort of main driver of the day. 80% of all of our operations, that every 80 cents of every dollar the World Food Program spends is in a country that's fighting itself or another. So it's a, it's a pretty considerable driver of the global food security challenges we're facing today. So let's fast forward uh, one slide here. When I go up to Capitol Hill and we have conversations with lawmakers, we're typically talking about two things with lawmakers to get them to care about international food aid programs and food assistance programs. We're talking either about the moral benefits of these programs, right? Food assistance, as we've seen dating all the way back to 1798 and the slave rebellion in Haiti and the events in Venezuela, these things, providing a response to these incredible suffering around the world rep represents what's best about the American people. It is a product of our own soft power. It's our contribution to humanity in a meaningful way. So some people react quite well to that. They still wanna be part of that moral high ground and that moral legacy that the United States has long captured. The other is economic which is the idea that when we provide international food aid to people around the world, it's not a concession that we're making. It's not dollars and food that we're giving away, but it's a roundabout investment back in the American economy. It's the idea that investing in people who cannot feed themselves and their family ultimately leads to more markets for American products and American consumers. So there are people who are motivated by the economic benefits of these aid programs. But what I want to finish up with today is talking about the national security implications of doing nothing when food insecurity is rising at such profound levels around the world. And like I've said, we've always known that food insecurity is a result of war and poverty, but we know very little about the other direction. What happens when people's base human needs, most basic human needs are not met? At what point do they turn to make impossible choices, sometimes participating in violence? Josette Shearing, the former executive director of the World Food Program, now one, two, three, four directors ago, used to say that hungry people do one of three things. They revolt, they migrate, or they die. And we're starting to see that lawmakers are understanding this in a kind of anecdotal way. So if you advance the slide, tell you about a couple conversations and quotes we've seen over the years. Senator Pat Roberts, chairman of the Agriculture Committee years ago, used to say, show me a nation that can't feed itself and I'll show you a nation in chaos. Jim Mattis, if you don't fund the State Department, I've got to buy more bullets. We have others like Senator Lindsey Lindsey uh, Graham, who sits on the uh, State and Foreign Operations Appropriations Subcommittee in the Senate responsible for how we spend dollars in, in foreign places and in international assistance. He said, feed them now or fight them later. So there is this anecdotal understanding of this relationship. But what we've been trying to do at the World Food Program USA is to advance this narrative a little further. And so part of my job is research. And that's what we've been doing over the last five years is really trying to understand this relationship. So let's advance the slide. If you go into the national security strategy for the United States, which is a document that typically comes out every few years, it admitted, there's gaps in this, of course, but sometimes when a new administration comes in, they'll wanna re-up their national defense strategy. The Biden administration defense strategy has just come out about a year ago. It cites food and food insecurity on 30 occasions. It's the tallest bar on this graph. You can see that this sort of anecdotal conversations that have been happening in the halls of Congress are starting to make their way into the formal institutions, our defense strategy. The Department of Defense is starting to take these transnational threats quite seriously, whether it's climate or food insecurity. 
So let's advance the slide. We've done two reports on this now that I'd love to direct your attention to. The first one is called Winning the Peace, Hunger, and Instability. And just this past year, we finished a report called Dangerously Hungry, the link between food insecurity and instability. And this is looking at the academic research behind the ways that food insecurity drives instability in the planet. It's trying to make the case for what happens if we do nothing to these hunger emergencies. We know that they will eventually metastasize into some greater form of violence. We know that they will eventually make their way back to American shores. So let's advance the slide and I'll tell you a little bit about the findings of this research. What was interesting is when you go into the academic databases and you start pulling down articles related to food-related instability, you find that when we did our first study, going all the way back into the early 20th century, all the way up until 2017, we only found about 3,000 references. In the period from 2017 to 2022, we found 8,000 academic references, which means that this subject this idea that food insecurity itself can lead to instability is gaining momentum around, among people who are thinking about the causes of conflict today. So let's advance the slide. And what we find, of course, is that about 50% of all the research that's happened over 20 years on this topic has been produced in the last five years alone. So you can imagine this was a great time to be digging into this literature. Let's advance the slide one more, please. Now, this isn't going to be legible to the people here in the room, but I do want to just uh, talk you through this. And folks on their computers at home, I think we'll be able to see this in greater detail. What we're looking at here are the main buckets. If you take those 8,000 articles and you group them appropriately on the link between food insecurity and instability, you'll find that generally speaking, food produces conflict in three settings. When it's driven by climate, when it is driven by an economic shock, or when there is competition over natural resources. And what we found is that researchers in this space have tested at least 12 individual variables, and those are things like crop yields, falling crop yields, rising food prices, agricultural GDP, reliance on agriculture in the sector. And they've linked those things to at least eight different types of instability around the planet, ranging from riots and protests all the way up to interstate war. So what we're doing here is trying to take what we hear from Senator Lindsey Graham, what we hear from Pat Roberts, what we hear uh, from folks like Jim Mattis, and try to provide some empirical basis to those comments that they've made in the past. And we find that that relationship is incredibly strong and robust, and we're only now in the past five years learning most uh, more about it. So let's fast forward one slide. If you look across crises now through the lens of food-related instability over the past, let's call it a decade, Darfur back in the early 2000s was labeled by Ban Ki-moon, then Secretary General of the United Nations, as the first climate change crisis. Right there, you had predominantly Arab pastoralists coming into contact with ethno-African agriculture communities leading to violence in that place. Now, of course, there's so many other factors involved in all of these conflicts, and we'll talk a little bit about you know, the asterisks that we need to put next to these things at the end. But Darfur is one of the first examples that we have of a climate change and a food-related conflict. The Lake Chad Basin, where you see the rise of Boko Haram, Lake Chad was a, uh, the Lake Chad Basin in particular lost about 70% of its size uh, in the early 2000s over the, uh, because of desertification from the Sahara Desert. We have researchers who believe that that led to the rise in Boko Haram because of the loss of, of livelihoods and the abhorrent living conditions faced by people in the Lake Chad Basin. Not to mention the conflict between pastoralists, people raising cattle and people trying to farm in those areas and the competition over land that existed in those places. The same is happening with the global food crisis in 2007 and 2008. When food prices shot through the roof in 2007 and 2008 because of economic considerations, the price of fuel and major crop failure in Russia and poor, poor production in the United States and South America, there was riots and protesting in 40 different countries. We had two countries at least one was a very strong link, Haiti, that its government was toppled as a result of those riots and protests. The same was true in Madagascar, although that, that's a little more complicated setting where you had a lot of 
uh, land grabs happening there and foreign entities buying up land in Madagascar. Syria is another example where there is a dotted line between food insecurity and instability in that place. When the conflict broke out in Syria in 2011, the country was experiencing what one, research call, one researcher called the worst drought event since agriculture began in the Fertile Crescent 10,000 years ago. Syria was a mess. And you had more than a million farmers from the, the productive regions of Syria moving to the southwest city of Dara'a, where most of the protests and violence began in Syria. There was also uh, some groundwater pumping strategies there that were, uh, that were less than optimal that also led to increased pressure on water resources in the region as well. So between the drought and the unsustainable groundwater pumping practices, you can sort of draw a line between what happened there and the start of violence in Syria. Arab Spring is another situation where you had crop loss in Russia and Eurasia that led to rising prices, bread prices in the Middle East coinciding with the rise of the Arab Spring. And in Sri Lanka this year, because of Ukraine's, last year, because of you. Ukraine's uh, invasion uh, was a situation where food prices jumped very quickly uh, and we ended up uh, with the government being displaced there as well. So these are just a couple examples of when we sort of reframe frame our world and we look at it through the lens of food-related instability. And we question the common drivers of conflict around the planet. We understand that food insecurity itself can be a really important factor in that. So let's advance a slide and we're wrapping up here in just a moment. The situation looks something like this. And again, this will be easier to read for folks on their computers at home, but food related instability is going to be always a combination of these drivers, right? Climate change, economic shocks, resource competition, but there has to be an individual motivator as well. What we're not saying here in this research is that hungry people are violent and that violent people are always hungry. That's not the case. There has to be individual motivation, voter, motivators involved as well. In fact, one of the greatest predictors of conflict in the world is a history of it. So places that are coming out of conflict, who have a mental history of conflict in their, in their countries are more likely to fall back into conflict. That being said, when you combine these drivers, these food shocks to the food system with motivators like desperation, when Boko Haram offers someone $50 to join their cause, when someone offers them a bike to join their cause, when they offer them to feed their family and they couldn't otherwise do it, people make horrible decisions and difficult decisions to join violent extremists. The same is true for government responses. Government that fails to meet the needs of its people, fails to provide for the food security of its people, is often met with mistrust. And there's a sense of a loss and lack of justice in those places especially in rural areas where you see the sort of most severe forms of violence emerging as it relates to food security. These are places far from the police arm of the state. These are places where uh, violent extremists in particular are setting up parallel structures to the government saying, listen, the government won't meet your needs, but we can. And that's an important development that's happening and, and based on governance as well. And then there's, a, of course, uh, food insecurity builds on existing grievances in countries. I think it's best to think of it as the straw that breaks the camel's back, right? When you have a society that's already broken and cleaving, food insecurity can be the thing that puts it over the edge, that causes people to rally, that causes people to riot and protest, that causes people to see inequities in society. So this is the sort of framework for food-related instability that I like to think about. So let's jump to the next and perhaps last slide. Yeah, I think that's it. So when we go up to, just to conclude here, when I go up to Capitol Hill and I talk to lawmakers, you know, there's of course a lot of respect and history, respect for the history of these international food aid programs. But the question that always comes back is, where are the major hunger emergencies and how can we get food aid into those places? That's fair. And we love that.
presidential candidate. We haven't heard any conversation about global food security. It's not on the radar yet, and it should be. I think if you go back and ask Eisenhower how he feels about this current crisis, Crises do not respect borders today. If we allow food insecurity to grow to unsustainable levels to the United States, and we will pay that price tenfold. So I'll leave it there and hope we can open up for some maybe some questions in the room. And I'm not sure, Joy, if you're monitoring anything online, but we'll go from there. All right. Um... We don't have any questions online just, just yet. We do have a comment. Someone says there's too much waste in America and the rest of the Western world. Uh, but if you have questions in here, oh, we do have questions. Well, while you're getting your question out, let's, let's talk briefly about the comment because food loss and waste is a big factor. You know, we do lose about a third of all the food that we produce on this planet, the food loss and waste. It just happens in different places. In the places where the World Food Program works, food loss and waste tends to happen at the farm gate. It means food that's lost in silos because of insufficient infrastructure. So it doesn't even make it to the consumer most often. When the United States here, we're talking about food loss and waste, we're typically talking about what's lost in restaurants, what's lost in grocery stores, what's lost in your refrigerators. It's a very different dynamic. The food lost and waste process, lost and waste process is, is significant. Uh, but it is also a major contributor to the underlying problem of climate change. When we talk about food systems contributions to climate change, we usually is that are introducing nitrogen into the atmosphere or methane into the atmosphere. Uh, but we're not often talking about the food loss and waste that is producing methane in landfills uh, around the United States and in uh, other places around the world. So it's a great comment. Go ahead. Okay, my question is, are there ways that you're preemptively battling food, you know, food insecurities? I know you can identify things that might be happening in certain yeah. countries, but what are the ways that you're trying to preempt, you know, attack that so it doesn't explode? Yeah. It, that question reminds me of a comment that was made by uh, one of our former executive directors of the World Food Program, Earthrun Cousin, she said at a board meeting once of the World Food Program that we cannot afford to save the same life twice. And why that's important is because we really have limited resources available to us, right? Last year, the World Food Program received about $7 billion from the United States government. This year, we received about three. <clears throat> It's a $4 billion gulf between last year and this. Now, there was some supplemental funding because of the events in Ukraine, so it's not apples to apples, but ambition is down. How resources get allocated. In fact, across 50% of WP's operations, we've already cut rations and staff because of that loss in funding. So you got to get ahead of crises, which means you're not just saving lives, but you're trying to change them. And so that means a different type of programming. It means maybe you're not bringing food in. Maybe you're not even bringing cash into those places. Maybe you're having people involved in programs that resemble a lot like the conservation, Civilian Conservation Corps, Works Progress Administration. We have a lot of programs uh, in our food assistance for asset portfolio at the World Food Program where people are involved in planting trees or they're involved in building market feeder roads, bridges, dams, et cetera, critical infrastructure that will be responsible and help those countries and places get on their own feet so we don't have to come back in with assistance last year. Some of the best programming there is happening in the African Sahel, southern part of the Sahara Desert, where you've got people involved in land reclamation activities. So trying to take partially desertified lands and make them vibrant again by planting in a certain way and digging half moons and concentrating rainfall into smaller and smaller areas so you can have productivity there. Uh, those are places where we've seen dramatic reductions in food aid needs year in and year out based on those interventions. So it's a great question. It costs a lot less to get ahead of these crises than it does to respond to them. Do we have any other questions in the room? Um, 
where where are you looking at right now for those uh, areas where if we would move with the food, it could forestall what you see coming? Are there a couple of areas right yeah. now that you would identify? Yeah, I mean, there, there are hot spots of hunger around the planet, and then there's hot spots of fragility, and they very often overlap. So you've got a pretty good sense. Remember when I was talking about the greatest predictor of violence is a history of it in many places? Well, there's a lot of places in the African Sahel that have experienced coups. We're now calling the region between Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger the coup belt because of the political change that's happened there in recent years. The Sahel is a place where I think you'll find that AFRICOM, one of our combatant command centers for the United States, is concentrating a lot of its time and effort in development spending, not military intervention, because they believe that those are hot spots of violent extremism that we need to get ahead of. So we're investing a fair amount of money in those places. The other places where the United States is traditionally spending a lot of money is the Syrias of the world and the Yemens of the world. Right? These are places with you know, multi, now decades long protracted crises that um, if we don't get ahead of, we'll continue to descend into further chaos. So you know, obviously the highest levels of need right now and the highest levels of fragility and likelihood of conflict don't always li line up. You know, for example, the highest levels of need are going to be in places like Afghanistan, in Yemen, Syria, South Sudan, Sudan, uh, and Gaza. Gaza in particular right now. You've got literally 200, or sorry, 2 million people, 2.2 million people who are facing, which is the entirety of the population in the Gaza Strip, are facing extreme levels of hunger. They'd be categorized into the highest levels that we possibly have of hunger. And 500,000 of them are facing what is looking like famine-like conditions, although that hasn't been declared yet. There are, you know, look around the world and you see people in that catastrophic phase of hunger. There's only about 130,000 people in the world combined we would call and classify in that way. Gaza's got 500,000 alone. So it's a pretty remarkable situation right now on the ground. Um, it's not an easy, uh, not, not a simple answer to your question, but just to say, um, you know, uh, there is much better coordination today between the United States military industrial complex and our State Department and development inter interventions, right? The now, because of changes in the National Security Council, you have the, uh, you have the administrator of USAID, Samantha Power, sitting on the National Security Council providing that critical insight into issues impacting U.S. national security. There's a, a, a civilian military affairs unit within DOD that's thinking more about uh, how we bridge this sort of humanitarian development and peace net nexus. And we've got folks in combatant command centers around the world from USAID who are providing counsel on what development activities that our military can be helping to support around the world. Now, the last thing we want, I should clarify here, the last thing that I am arguing for in any of this is for the United States government to get in the business of providing food assistance. Food assistance is something that needs to be provided objectively, neutrally. The way you keep humanitarians safe is by keeping them distance from, distant from politics and distant especially from military intervention and persuasion. So we're not asking for that. What we're asking for is additional dollars in humanitarian accounts. Uh, some of that might come from the Department of Defense. I just say that uh, I saw a couple days ago that the Houthis ordered all foreign aid out of the country, and I saw that, but I see it in an entirely new light after hearing what you've said today. Oh, I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, you Thank know, the, the situation in Yemen has been uh, start and stop, frankly. It has been, uh, I think, on two or three occasions now that we've had to halt the assistance moving into Yemen. Uh, for various reasons. Sometimes it was on the part of the Saudi-led regime, and sometimes it was on the part of the Houthis, so it's just not finger-pointing necessarily. But um, just to say that's a very volatile context. And you can tell now, because of the war in Gaza and the events uh, happening in the Middle East, that it's tied into a much broader regional landscape that has completely complicated that picture. So it's not just Saudi intervention or American intervention in Yemen. Uh, or Iran's support of the Houthis, it's tied into a much, much larger debacle now that, that you know, that's the job of political science, scientists and State Department officials to try to unravel. 
We did have a question online and it says, how do you convince politicians about the direct link between food insecurity, climate change, and national security in the U.S.? Yeah. I mean, uh, frankly, there's not as much convincing that's necessary anymore. I mean, the way that you talk to lawmakers, of course, is by identifying areas of mutual interest. Um, you know, I think someone like Jerry Moran, he's, he's mentioned to us in the past, instead of having a midlife crisis and buying a truck, he wanted to get in the game of, of helping feed people around the world. He's driven by the morality of it all. He's driven by the economics of it all. He's driven by the national security imperative. Um, but I would say that that climate change in particular, which I think is what the question is getting at, climate change in particular has uh, really been raised and elevated in the national security subconscious. There are people talking about this in ways that they haven't before. When you have uh, attribution science out now that's getting pretty sophisticated, that links some sort of climate-related extreme event to the impacts of climate change, that's important. So the military industrial complex, the Department of Defense, the National Security Council and others are, are thinking and I think being smarter about these issues. Uh, so there isn't a whole lot of convincing necessary up on lawmakers, uh, up on Capitol Hill. They're hearing it from all sides that climate related extreme events are going to be driving instability around the planet uh, and that uh, it certainly isn't going to help with global fragility. It's only going to make it worse. So uh, there's just a lot happening in the academic data set. When you look at the uh, when you look at the work that we did with with Dangerously Hungry, a huge proportion of the studies that link food insecurity to instability begin with some sort of climate related extreme event. So the climate scientists and the people working in climate security space are moving them all all forward uh, quite a lot. All right, thank you. It is one o'clock. So um, we are going to say goodbye to our virtual audience. I wrap this up. I'm not going to kick you out, though, if you'd like to stay around as long as Dr. Silva is OK. Um, so if you'll give, just give me a few minutes to wrap up and Great. do the last few slides, and we'll call it a day. Thanks, all. So once again, thank you to Dr. Silva. Um, I just want to encourage everyone to come out to our programs for the year. Again, Waging Peace is our theme for 2024. Uh, we are producing great new programs. We have a digital reels program that gives you a little snippet history in a minute. Uh, we call it um, the whole shebang. So you can look that up. We also have a podcast that gets released uh, about mid-month. And uh, next month, we will be looking at refugee relief. And so we will have people uh, talking about that. So please look, look for that for us. And um, other than that, we do want to thank the Eisenhower Foundation and the Jeff Cook Memorial Foundation uh, for their contribution. It is their support that allows us to hold these programs. And so we are especially grateful for those. So if there's nothing else, I'll say thank you so much and have a wonderful afternoon.